Hello, welcome to my channel. Um, I am back with a short story based on five random words. Um, been a while, um, but today I uh, finally took the words that I've been looking at for several weeks and uh, came up with an idea, uh, which I think hopefully suits them. Um, what was I going to say? I had something important to say. I've forgotten it. Anyway, it doesn't matter. First thing to remember is you must subscribe. If you're not a subscriber, please. And I think I've checked and something like 60% of people watching are not subscribers. Just subscribe. It really, really does help this channel. Um, the more subscribers you have on YouTube, the more your videos are projected into people's recommended viewing and the more people watch. And it has a sort of spiraling effect. So anyway, um, I have a story for today. And this I think is tale number 138. It's based on the following random words. And it's called the Miracle at Bozogram. I'm watching my left foot slip off the wet granite and there's nothing I can do about it. My right foot is wedged tightly into a diagonal groove of the shard-like protrusion where I and seven other commandos are training on this stormy, squally and apparently typical night. Typical for northern France, that is, where it's rumoured we'll be deployed for a coastal assault if this war doesn't end by the autumn of 42. This is Cornwall, a remote place called Bozigran, on the rugged southwest coast on the toe of the foot of the leg of our British Isles. I was called up just shy of my 21st birthday one year ago and I decided to train to be a commando. It sounded exciting, an elite fighting force ready for anything. As a relatively fit and educated young man, I was fast-tracked. I've got four more school qualifications than most of our unit and I read a book now and again, which is why inevitably they call me the professor. All I need is a pair of round glasses and I'll be a walking cliché. But I wanted to be a hero, not a fusty academic, which is why I relished the more physical challenges of commando training. Even, it has to be said, our current nightmare scenario, clambering up this precipitous and slippery face. We're all pretty green at this climbing malarkey. We do our best while the sergeant below us barks unhelpful instructions and encouragement. That's right, O'Reilly. Get your carabiner on the rope. Hurry up, Professor. It's bucketing down as if we somehow failed to notice the virtual waterfall cascading down the lichen-covered, weather-shattered rock. Our head torches light up the rivulet streaming down the granite and bouncing into our eyes. Reflected slivers of light blur into starry patterns, like we're in a dance hall under festoons rather than hanging off an icy, blasted rock face in the arse end of nowhere. Still, there is a real thrill to this activity, pushing our bodies and our courage towards their very limits. This afternoon, as we arrived at what's now known as Commando Ridge, following a three-mile march from the camp at Morva. Loaded down with all our kit, Sergeant MacPhail joked, What do you think, lads? With or without ropes? MacPhail has a very dry sense of humour, making it hard to tell whether he's kidding. For a second, I hoped we would try it without ropes, with just our animal cunning and the strength of our limbs, fingers and toes to keep us from calamity. Then it started raining. And after the second man scrambled up the 100-foot rock face, the sun's orange sliver finally dipped beneath a tobacco-hued sea. After one fearful fall, when a python wriggled itself free from a crevice and Private Baxter dropped ten feet until the next spike caught him, I wanted all the safety precautions I could get my hands on. One non-standard measure I've taken is to stitch your pocket square, Debs, inside my jerkin, just as you asked me to. The hanky you made from a square of your blouse. You said I should keep it close to my heart. Well, here it is, pressed to my chest between a layer of linen and another of coarse wool. I stitched it there so I wouldn't lose it. I'll find something less precious to use as a snot rag. I crossed myself before I set my first toe on this cliff face high above the thundering Atlantic, and the centre of that cross was your bluebell patterned blouse. Call me melodramatic, but I sincerely hope it keeps me safe if we're mobilised, just as you said it would. I've come to trust your eerie intuitions. Over the nine months of our courtship, I've realised you're practically a white witch, with your milky pale skin and mane of crow-dark hair, and me, a good Catholic boy, under your spell. What a pair we are. Halfway up my climb, approaching the diagonal crevice where a python is positioned, the wind picks up, chilling the parts of my face the balaclava doesn't cover, 
In fact, I can feel its fingers probing through the thin wool, a sow westerly coming in from the sea. It's so cold it's almost warm. In effect, at least, my blood rises to the challenge of its assault. I grunt and struggle to slip the carabiner up the rope, my fingers numb with the cold despite my fingerless climbing gloves. I can hear shouts from below, but the words are whipped out of my eardrums by the wind. There's an overtone of urgency in that voice. Actually, it's more than one voice. Something about an anchor? Something clatters past my ear. It's the rope with a python attached. Instants later, the bulky figure of Corporal Colin Jackson jerks to a stop at my side, his eyes wide with fear, blood running off the back of one hand. Ropes come free, he shouts. I'm coming down! He begins to bounce down the rock face, abseiling, belayed by our sergeant down below. I look up and see the one remaining python is moving, twitching with each bounce of the fourteen stone corporal. If it comes free, Jackson will take me with him as he falls. I have no choice. I unhook my carabiners and remove the rope from my harness. In the nick of time, as it happens, since the python overhead jerks free and plunges dagger-like, carrying its loop of rope, as Jackson drops twenty feet onto the waiting crash mat. I yank my left leg and hand away, four stiff toes with one claw-like hand holding me in place as the rope whips past me. In so doing, it pings my ear and the pain is extraordinary, despite the balaclava. Below, I hear Jackson yelp. I flick a glance down to see my buddy quickly roll aside, avoiding being brained by the falling python. I'm getting my wish after all. I'm bare-knuckling it, alone, ropeless, on this cold, icy granite. I'm 70 feet up. No nine-inch crash mat is going to break my fall. It's 30-odd feet to the top. Again, I have no choice. It's upwards, or nothing good. O'Reilly, just listen, lad. You're nearly there. Take a few breaths. Remember your training. McPhail's well-intentioned advice only enrages me. It's all very well for him, wrapped snugly in his parka with his flask of coffee, watching from below. A circle of light appears three feet above me, McPhail's torch beam the one he reserves for struggling climbers who need a little reassurance. It is usually accompanied by a cruel jest along the lines of My granny could hoof it up there faster than you, lad! Tonight the Sarge is tactfully silent as I reach up and into that light for a knurl of rock, curling my thumb and forefinger around it with the desperate instinct of a newborn locating a nipple. I free my right foot and stretch my knee up against the rock. I have perhaps five degrees of slope to help me fight gravity's inexorable pull, Overhead, for the final ten feet, the cliff becomes a brief overhang. Without rope, how can I even hope? My foot is slipping. My left foot, the one currently carrying all my weight. There's nowhere for my free hand to grab hold of. My right foot flounders for purchase. It all happens in weirdly attenuated slow motion. The wind whips me brutally as someone turns a fire hose on me from above. I can't hold on much longer. I look beyond the struggling foot, down to the grassy ledge where the men stare in sympathetic terror holding out the crash mat between them and shouting incoherently. Just beyond them, the grassy ledge ends and a slice of sea can be seen between rocky slivers. My heart threatens to explode in my chest as I use the remaining inch of purchase to push myself to my right, jumping three, maybe four feet to one side as my face and body slam against the stone and I slide with brutal inevitably down the granite. An icy slap in the silence of a black raging sea tells me I've calculated correctly. I've missed the ledge and fallen past the astonished commandos into the water. I kick my legs, ignoring the pain in my ribs, probably broken, and the sight of my face. I'm going to be considerably less pretty the next time I see you, Debs. My plunge ceases and becomes a slow rising as I burst from the surface of the surging waves and grasp the rope that's thrown to me. Only adrenaline can explain how I pull myself from that unforgiving tide. Adrenaline and the fear of losing you, a fear worse than wartime. And so, that's how you saved me. I felt a warmth in my chest which I somehow knew was the warmth of your breast against mine, a moment before I launched myself into space. Crazy as it seems, a miracle took place, and it had nothing to do with a cross around my neck. The lads came to visit me in the military hospital, and they brought a photo of the training slopes. It clearly showed that the gap between rocks into which I plunged was scarcely wider than a phone box. What are the chances, O'Reilly? cries the carrot-topped Finlay, a Scotsman barely 17 years old. Man, you're the luckiest bastard in England. I have to agree, for form's sake, grinning at the exuberant Scot, even as my scarred cheek aches under the bandage. Unbelievable, 
is the only word to emerge from the nearly taciturn Sergeant MacPhail, standing awkwardly playing with the grapes he's brought. He says it mostly to himself, I suspect. He can't believe the near catastrophe that has occurred on his watch, nor the fact that nobody has died. To lose a man in combat is bad enough for any officer. To lose one in basic training would be a shame too awful to contemplate. Believable, I demur. I have a guardian angel. In the quiet, sunlit ward, nobody offers a word of contradiction. And there you have it. <laughs> My little story. Um, this is based on a place, a real place, where commandos used to train. I will use a photograph of that place as the thumbnail for this um, piece. And uh, I've been there and I have well, I'm, I'm climbed it. I've climbed a bit of it. Um, not the proper slopes where the commandos train, but something adjacent. And uh, yeah, it's, I imagine it's, it was very tough um, under extreme circumstances to climb such a slope. So, uh, hope you enjoyed that. If you did, I would very much like it if you could share this video and subscribe, as I said, if you aren't a subscriber. And feel free to leave comments. And I will be back with another story very soon. Thanks for listening. Bye.